In Monster Hunter World, there are many aspects to consider when taking on a hunt. The target, your weapon, these are all important, but hunters who want optimal performance need to consider the build they use via the gear and armor they wear. I'm Darkblade, and here are the builds that I use for the sword and shield. The skills that you can gain from armor and even some weapons can help shape your hunter into specialized hunting machines. With the sword and shield, the weapon is one of the most versatile in the game, and as a result can fill many roles from tank, DPS, support, elemental focused, or element focused. So in this video I'll be demonstrating a mixed bag of builds I use for the weapon. The first build I like to use is the Elementalist build. This is a straightforward DPS build that utilises the Elementalist bonus. Now a disclaimer with the sword and shield, the weapon does benefit from elemental damage thanks to the fast sword slices you can pull off. However, with the Elementalist build, I tend to stick towards the slower, harder hitting shield attacks, as the shield attacks do not benefit from elemental or element effects. So for this build you'll need the Kaiser Crown Gamma, the Kulv Turoff's Aya Alpha, the Kaiser Vambraces Gamma, Nergigante Coil Beta and the Kaiser Greaves Gamma. I'm also using an Exploited Charm and for my weapon I've gone for the Turoff Slice of Mud. That has an Infinity Increase Augmentation and then an Augmentation of your choice. I went with a Slop Upgrade. You can as well use the Baroth Club if you want, which will give you similar results. As for the jewels, the first mandatory jewel would be the Elementalist jewel. This boosts the attack of weapons who have their elements or ailment hidden. Afterwards I've gone for DPS focused jewels. A tenderizer jewel to max out weakness exploit, mighty jewels to add some maximum might, and attack jewels to boost the attack boost level of the build, and a critical jewel to max out critical boost. Now if you've done what I've done here you should have a build with 100 health, 100 stamina, 385 attack, blue sharpness, unfortunately this cannot get to white sharpness thanks to the weapon I'm using, you'll have 55% affinity so long as you have maximum stamina, this will actually be 100% should you be going for weak points thanks to weakness exploit, you'll have no element and when it comes to your defense you have a high defense against fire but you're fairly weak to water and ice. As for the skills you have critical eye level 7 boosting the affinity of the build, Attack boost level 6, it would have been nice to get this to level 7, but as long as it gets to level 4, it's acceptable, as it gives you an extra 5% affinity. Critical boost level 3, that boosts the damage of our critical attacks. Weakness exploit, that boosts the affinity rating when going for weak points. Stun resistance level 2, this is a byproduct of the gear, but helps when it comes to defense. Maximum might level 2, that boosts our affinity, so long as we have maximum stamina and non-elemental boost to level 1, which as I said boosts the attack power of weapons who don't have an element. You also have the set bonus Master's Touch that prevents any sharpness loss so long as you crit a monster, and given this build has a very high affinity rating so long as you're going for weak points, then you shouldn't see any sharpness loss whatsoever. This is also one of the reasons why there is no handicraft on this build. Unfortunately most of this gear is relying on the Teostra Gamma armor pieces of gear, you can replace them with the Alpha or Beta, although it will be a pale comparison of a build. As I also mentioned, you can replace the Taroth Slice of Mud with the Baroth Club if you wish. Now, whilst this may not be as powerful in terms of just raw attack, it does come with a third augmentation slot on it, so you can customise it even further. The Baroth Club is also not locked behind RNG, unlike the Taroth Slice of Mud. But anyway, let's move away from the element less build to talk about the next one, which is the affinity based build. This build is a high affinity build that utilizes the Devil Joe sword and shield known as the Fatal Bite. So for this build you need the Draken Armet Alpha, Draken Male Alpha, Draken Vambraces Alpha, the Valhasat Coil Gamma and the Draken Greaves Alpha. I've also gone with a Handicraft Charm 3 and for my weapon, like I said, I'm using the Fatal Bite which is the Devil Joe sword and shield. This has an affinity increase augmentation on it and then an augmentation of your choice. Now in this video I have a second affinity increase augmentation on it but in all honesty this is not efficient and once I have the warrior streamstones I will be replacing this with either a slot upgrade or health regen augmentation instead. As for your jewels there are no real main mandatory ones it's just a case of going for jewels to boost your DPS. So I've gone for an attack jewel to get my attack boost to at least level 4, I've then gone for expert jewels to boost the critical eye, 3 tenderizer jewels to max out weakness exploit and then some mighty jewels to level up maximum might. Anyway if you've done what I've done here you should have a build with 100 health, 100 stamina, 346 attack, white sharpness, 55% affinity so long as you have maximum stamina, this will actually be 100% thanks to weakness exploit, you have 240 dragon rating with high elder seal and when it comes to defenses you'll have high defense against thunder and dragon but you're fairly weak to fire and ice. As for the skills you'll have the following, critical eye, level 6, 
attack boost level 4, crit boost level 3, weakness exploit level 3, handicraft level 3, this basically boosts the sharpness of the weapon you're using, maximum might level 3, recovery speed level 2, this is a byproduct of the gear, it's not really that vital, dragon attack level 1, again a byproduct of the gear but nonetheless can still help out the dragon rating of the fatal bite weapon and you'll have the airborne skill increasing the damage of your airborne attacks you also have the soul of the dragon set bonuses elemental airborne that increases the elemental damage when you perform a jumping attack and master's touch that prevents sharpness loss when you crit a monster and once again this is a high affinity build so you shouldn't have to worry about your weapon losing any sharpness when you're fighting a monster so long as you're going for weak points so as you can see this again is a DPS focused build, it has high affinity but could be lacking in the survivability department. Nonetheless you should be able to take on monsters very quickly with this build, even quicker if they don't have immunities to the dragon element. Alas though this build is reliant on the dragon armor set which is achieved by taking on Behemoth. Anyway let's move on to the next build which is the free element elemental build. As I mentioned the sword and shield can attack very fast especially when it comes to its sword slicing attacks. This means that it benefits from weapons that have elemental or ailment properties. This is a DPS build that utilizes the Taroth elemental weapons. These elemental weapons normally have their elements hidden as well. The reason these elements are hidden is normally because they are fairly high in rating. For the purpose of this video I'll be demonstrating a fire build. So for this build to work you'll need the Kaiser Crown Gamma, the Raphalos Male Beta, the Kaiser Vambraces Gamma, the Azure Star Lord Tacits Alpha and the Kaiser Greaves Gamma. You also need an Awakening Charm too and for my weapon I'm using the Taroth Slicer Fire. You can use whatever element you want here but like I said I'm demonstrating a fire build. I've also added an affinity increase augmentation to the weapon. Now as for the jaws, first the main mandatory jaw you'll need is a release jaw. This will max out the free element skill bringing out the full fire rating of the weapon we're using. Afterwards it's a case of using blaze jaws to max out the fire rating and I've gone for mighty jaws to give us a little bit more affinity. Now if you've done what I've done here you should have a build with 100 health, 100 stamina, 273 attack, white sharpness, 70% affinity so long as you have maximum stamina. This will actually be 100% thanks to the level 2 weakness exploit. You also have a maxed out fire rating of 510 and when it comes to defenses you have strong defense against fire but you're fairly weak to ice. Now as for the skills you'll have critical eye level 7, fire attack level 4, free element level 3, maximum might level 3, weakness exploit level 2, you only really need to go up to weakness exploit level 2 not level 3 because you would be going well over the 100% if you were to put weakness exploit level 3 in. Thanks to maximum might we only miss 30% and weakness exploit at level 2 provides that. You'll also have handicraft level 1 and you'll have the Set bonuses Teostra's Technique Master's Touch which prevents sharpness loss when you crit a monster and you'll have the Rathalos Mastery Critical Element which increases elemental damage when you crit a monster and with this build both these set bonuses should be highly effective. So as you can see it's a pretty straightforward elemental build but unfortunately it requires pieces of the Teostra Gamma set and reliant on getting weapons that have their elements hidden such as the Taroth slicer weapons. Nonetheless you can swap out the weapon in this build for whatever element you want to use and you should still get the same effects. Just remember to change out the blaze jewels though to match whatever element you are using. But anyway let's move on to the next build which is the support build. This is a build focused purely on support. This build was created primarily for the extreme behemoth and focuses on keeping you and your team alive rather than doing damage. As a result this build is strongly advisable in group play. So for this build You'll need the Empress Crown Beta, Empress Mel Beta, Empress Vampraces Beta, Empress Coil Beta and the Empress Grease Beta. I've also gone for an Earplug Charm 3 and for my weapon I'm using the Tora Blossom 3. This has a slot upgrade augmentation on it and then augmentations of your choice. I went with a defense and health regen augmentation to add survivability to the build. Now as for the jewels this is where the complexity of the build comes in. First I've added some earplug jewels to max out the earplug skill. I've then gone for friendship jewels to max out the wide range skill which is vital for support builds as this means that everyone will be affected by your potions and such. I've then gone for gobbler jewels to increase how fast my hunter can consume potions. I've then added a vitality jewel to max out the health boost for this build. A shield jewel to allow me to block unblockable attacks. Next you'll want fungi form jewels which provides the mushroom mancer skill allowing us to provide even more buffs to our team and finally I've gone for a maintenance jaw to just max out tool specialist. 
Anyway, if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 150 stamina, once your stamina is maxed out, 259 attack, blue sharpness, 0% affinity, but like I said, this build isn't focused on DPS. You are a 390 poison rating, with strong defenses against fire, water and thunder, but you're fairly weak to ice and dragon. As for the skills, you'll have earplugs level 5, meaning that you won't get stunned by any monster roars, wide range level 5, which means that everyone will get the full effect of whatever potion you consume, so long as they are in close proximity to you, you have health boost level 3, increasing your maximum health, speed eating level 3, which means that you should be able to drink potions as if you were taking shots, Mushroom Mancer level 3, which lets you eat raw mushrooms instantly and provide even more extra buffs to your teammates. Tool Specialist level 3, which reduces the cooldown of our boosters and mantles. Peak Performance level 2, which increases our attack so long as we have maximum health. Vade Extender level 2, which increases the distance we can roll when avoiding attacks. And Guard Up level 1, that allows us to block unblockable attacks. You'll also have the Lunostra's favour set bonuses, Stamina Cap Up, increasing our maximum of stamina, as well as the Mind's Eye skill that prevents our weapon from bouncing off a monster's hide. So as you can see, this is quite a support focused build. You're not going to be doing high amounts of damage with it whatsoever. Now, damage options are available to this build thanks to peak performance and the fact that you can poison a monster, which means that if there is any break in a monster's attack, should it be trapped or stunned and there's no danger to yourself or your teammates of taking damage, then you'll have a short moment to apply the poison debuff to a monster, allowing it to take damage over time from you, which in turn means that when it wakes up, you can go back to healing while still providing a source of damage to the overall hunt. Another reason as well that the Puke Puke weapon was used in this was because of the sheer amount of gem slots the weapon has available to it. Now you can replace the weapon with whatever you see fit just so long as it has at least three dual slots available to it. With this build as well I'd also advise getting used to using Mushroom Mancer, carrying raw mushrooms into a fight as well as the components to craft potions whilst out in the field to get the most out of this build. Anyway, let's move on to the next build, which is the ailment build. For the purpose of this video, I'll be showing off a paralysis build. As I mentioned as well, thanks to the sword and shield being able to attack fast, you can apply the paralyzing effect to monsters quite quickly and quite often with this build. So for this build, you'll need the Zora Headgear Gamma, Zora Hide Gamma, Zora Claws Gamma, the Basil Coil Beta, and Dante's Leather Boots Alpha. You also need a Handicraft Charm 3, and for my weapon, I'm using the Turoff Slicer Num with an Affinity Increase Augmentation on it, and then an Augmentation of your choice. As for the jewels, first day I've gone for Paralyzer Jewels to max out the Paralysis rating of this build. I've then gone for an Earplug Jewel to max out the Earplug rating, as the Zora Gamma pieces do come with the skill already on it, and using one gem to max it out is kind of worth it. I've then gone for Expert Jewels, Tenderizer Jewels, and I topped it off with a Sharp Jewel to provide that protective polish, allowing us to keep that white sharpness for a little bit longer. Anyway, if you don't want it done here, you should have a build with 100 health, 100 stamina, 245 attack, white sharpness, 65% affinity, which is actually 100% should you be going for weak points, 300 paralysis rating, and when it comes to defense, you have an incredibly high defense against fire, but you're fairly weak to water and ice. As for the skills, you have critical eye level 6, earplugs level 5, paralysis attack level 3, weakness exploit level 3, handicraft level 3, windproof level 2, a byproduct of the gear but can still be useful in defensive situations, tremor resistance level 2, again a byproduct of the gear but just like windproof can come in handy on the defense, protective polish level 1 and for the set bonuses we'll have the Zora Magdaros mastery critical status that increases the abnormal status effect damage when landing critical hits. Now as I said, thanks to the Sword and Shield being able to attack quite fast, it means that you'll be able to apply that ailment effect quite quickly to a monster. You can of course replace the Turoff Slicer Num with the standard Great Gyros weapon, the Maladies Tabar. This has a little bit less affinity, but comes with an extra augmentation slot so you can customise it how you wish. I'd also as well strongly advise taking the Apothecary's Mantle to allow you to potentially paralyse a monster even more. For me personally this is one of my favourite crowd controlling builds and it also works well in group play when you want to have someone dedicated to paralysing a monster. Anyway let's move on to the next build which is the tank or survivability build. This build is a health regen build focusing on defence making your hunter incredibly difficult to kill. So for this build you'll need the Nergagante Helm Alpha, the Valhasak Mel Gamma, the Valhasak Braces Beta, the Valhasak Coil Gamma and the Empress Greaves Beta. I'm also using an Attack Charm 3 and for the weapon I'm using the Empress's Edge Ruin. 
This has a health regen augmentation on it for extra survivability. As for the jewels, I've gone for a Vitality Jewel to max out health boost, Tenderizer Jewels to allow me some offensive options through the Weakness Exploit skill, I've gone for Medicine Jewels, Recovery Jewels, a Shield Jewel to allow me to block unblockable attacks, and some Iron Wall Jewels to improve the effectiveness of our shield when blocking attacks. I've also gone for a Sharp Jewel to allow me to keep the right sharpness for a little bit longer when I sharpen my weapon. Now, if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build. We have 150 health, 100 stamina, 318 attack, white sharpness, 25% affinity, 120 blast rating, with strong defense against water, but you're fairly weak to dragon. As for your skills, you'll have attack boost level 4, health boost level 3, recovery up level 3, recovery speed level 3, weakness exploit level 3, peak performance level 2, a byproduct of the gear, but can still be useful, especially as it will be recovering health quite quickly. Guard level 2, maximum might level 2, dragon attack level 1, a byproduct of the gear, and unfortunately it's wasted on this build. Guard up level 1, allows us to block unblockable attacks. Protective polish level 1, hasten recovery level 1, which is what is found on the Empress Edge Ruin, that allows us to recover health when we're attacking a monster. And we'll have the Valhazak Vitality Set Bonus Super Recovery, which when combined with health boost, recovery up, recovery speed, and hasten recovery as well as the health regen augmentation that means when we're in combat we'll be naturally regaining health at quite a high rate this will be even higher for when we're actually attacking a monster so as you can see the defensive options for this build are quite high whilst it may not be the most defensive build as it only has guard level 2 it's nonetheless a build i feel safe when i'm using there is little chance of me dying when using this build thanks to the health regen skills, as well as the maneuverability and the fact that the sword and shield can block attacks. If you wanted to change the build and lean even more towards defense, you could replace the attack charm 3 with the iron side charm, which would level up the guard skill even further. But anyway, let's move on to the next build, which is a very unusual build, as I don't normally show these off, but nonetheless, I wanted to show this one off, as I often use it with the sword and shield, which is the gatherer build. This build doesn't really focus necessarily on support, DPS or anything, it focuses more on exploration, going out into the world, completing green bounties and just general exploration. This build does have some offensive options so it can still take down monsters, but nonetheless this build excels when it comes to gathering materials out in the world. So for this build I'm using the Empress Crown Beta, Nergagante Male Beta, the Valhasak Braces Beta, the Kirin Hoop Gamma and the Empress Greaves Beta. I'm also using a Procurer's Charm and for my weapon once again I'm using the Taurus Blossom. This has the augmentations left over from the support build so it includes a slot upgrade, health regen augmentation and defense increase augmentation on it. As for your jewels, now like I said this is focused on gathering more than anything else. So I've added botany jewels, geology jewels, vitality jewels to max out my health, sprinter and refresh jewels to allow me to recover stamina quickly and finally I've added a few tenderizer jewels just to allow me a little bit of affinity when fighting monsters as well as a sharp jewel to reduce sharpness loss thanks to protective polish. Anyway, if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 150 stamina, 259 attack, blue sharpness, 0% affinity, which is actually 50% should you be going for weak points, 390 poison rating, okay defenses against thunder and water, but you're fairly weak to ice and dragon. You'll also have the following skills, botanist level 4, this increases the quantity of herbs and other consumable items you can gather. Health boost level 3, weakness exploit level 3, marathon runner level 3 which reduces our stamina loss when we're sprinting, stamina surge level 3 which increases how quickly our stamina recovers, geologist level 3 which increases the number of times you can use gathering points such as bone piles, mining outcrops and so on and so forth, evade extender level 2 which increases how far we can roll, Peak performance level 1, pro transporter level 1, this increases how fast we can walk when carrying heavy objects like eggs and such. Honey hunter level 1, which increases the quantity of honey we receive when gathering them in the field. And protective polish level 1. We'll also have the Lunostra's favour set bonus, stamina cap up, increasing our maximum stamina. So as you can see, this is a build not really built for fighting. It does have some options thanks to weakness exploit, protective polish, peak performance when it does come to a fight, but this build is more suited for when you're completing bounties, especially the green ones to gather herbs, mushrooms, mining outcrops, so on and so forth. This build will allow you to quickly do those and is a great way for farming armor spheres. But anyway, let's move on to the final build, which is the budget build. Now, the budget builds I've gone for are normally elementalist budget builds. However, I'm going to be demonstrating a elemental budget build. 
This utilizes the Master Bang weapon, and as such is a Thunder Elemental build. So for this build you need the Raphalos Helm Beta, the Raphalos Mel Beta, the Zora Claws Beta, the Nergigante Coil Beta, and the Kirin Leg Guards Beta. I've also got a Mighty Charm too, and for my weapon, as I said, I'm using the Master Bang, and this would have had a Affinity Increase augmentation on it, and then an augmentation of your choice, but unfortunately I ran out of Stream Stones. As for your jewels, obviously this is a budget build so you won't have many of them, however you should be easily able to come across bolt jewels to increase the thunder rating of this build, these can even be made at the Elder Melder. Afterwards, if you can get a tenderizer and mighty jewel and then top it off with expert jewels. Now if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 100 health, 100 stamina, 318 attack, blue sharpness, unfortunately we can't get this sharpness to white, you'll have 41% affinity so long as you have maximum stamina. If I had the augmentation on this build it would be 51% affinity but I don't. But overall you should have 100% affinity so long as you go for weak points and you'll have a maxed out 430 thunder rating with strong defense against fire but you're fairly weak to dragon. As for your skills you'll have attack boost level 4. Now normally on elemental builds I don't often go for attack boost but nonetheless the attack boost will give us that 5% extra affinity as well as increase the raw portion of the weapon's attack. You'll have thunder attack level 3 increasing the thunder damage of the weapon, free element level 3 which releases the full amount of elemental damage from this weapon. You'll have Weakness Exploit level 3, Maximum Might level 3, and Critical Eye level 2. You'll also have the Raphalos Mastery Critical Element set bonus, which increases elemental damage when you crit a monster. Now this budget build can work with any weapon that has a hidden element or even ailment to a lesser extent. It does work better with elemental weapons and if you do change it out, remember to switch out the bolt jewels to whatever element you are using. Nonetheless, this is a surprisingly effective build. It should also be noted that the Master Bang weapon is a nice alternative for elementalist builds as the element is hidden, especially if you don't want to contend with negative affinity that is found on the Taroth Slicer Mud or the Baroth Club. So there we have it, those are the builds that I like to use for the Sword and Shield. Of course Monster Hunter World is always being updated with new monsters and gear which can potentially cause these builds to change and become even stronger, so if any major updates happen to any of the builds I'll be sure to release an updated video. Also remember that almost any task in Monster Hunter World can be taken on with any weapon and gear sets. You don't have to use what is shown off in these videos, these are just the sets that I personally like to use. Anyway, I hope you found this video helpful or informative, and until next time, I've been Darblade, bringing you the builds I use for the Sword and Shield in Monster Hunter World. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks for watching, subscribe and like for more.